name is Dawn Emsalem, and I am the library director. Um, and before we begin, I'd like to just make a few, uh, a few technical notes. This lecture is going to be recorded, um, and we will be putting it on the YouTube, the library's YouTube website. Um, in addition, um, Dr. Ramsey welcomes questions during the presentation. So Gretchen and I will be monitoring the chat if you have any questions um, during the presentation. In addition, we'll be having time after the presentation if you'd like to save your questions for then, or um, you can uh, unmute and ask them that way as well at the end. Um, Dr. Matthew Ramsey is an associate professor of English and chair of the Department of English Communications and Media at Salve Regina University. He received his PhD in literature and film studies from The Ohio State University and has published widely on William Faulkner's work. Today, Dr. Ramsey examines the work of renowned Nobel Prize winning Southern author William Faulkner and his intersections with popular culture. To illustrate issues regarding the canon literary snobbery or assumptions about Southern white male authors, Dr. Ramsey employs examples of film, novels, and other works, including a Saturday Evening Post all-male war story transformed into a Joan Crawford melodrama, a scandalous pre-code Hollywood film about rape and murder, and The Long Hot Summer and the Queerness of 1950s Southern Melodramas. With that, let's welcome Dr. Matthew Ramsey, whose presentation is titled, Taking Popular Culture Seriously, or How I Learned to Love Hack Faulkner. Thank you, Don, and thank you for all that silent applause, everybody. That's very nice. Um, let me put up the PowerPoint. As Don said, I'm happy anytime you've got questions while we're going through this. Um, I don't have like a big capper or anything and I don't have to get to all my slides basically. So I'm basically just gonna to try to give you um, some of the broad brush strokes of, of uh, sort of what my scholarly career has looked like, um, where it came from. I hope it doesn't end up being um, too self-indulgent. Um, but I wanted to start with this photo because in some ways this is kind of where this all starts and it starts with that bust of Shakespeare right there in the middle of all that pop culture detritus. <laughs> right. um, so that bust was given to me by my parents when I had announced that I was going to go to graduate school and I was going to be a Shakespearean. That was my, my goal, right? So the, the most canonical thing you can be is a Shakespearean, right? This is the, the highest sort of form of, of, of literary studies. Uh, and before I was going to go to, to uh, graduate school, I knew that's what I wanted to do. I want to be a Shakespearean. I want to be a serious scholar. And then things happened. Um, things in terms of the who the faculty at Ohio State was, both in terms of the Shakespearean I went to, uh, I was going to go work with, had a heart attack the semester before I came, so I couldn't work with him. Uh, and then the other thing that happened was I took a Shakespeare class that was sort of uh, focused on new historicism, which at this point, you know, uh, early 1990s was sort of the hot thing in Shakespeare studies. And new historicism basically tried to argue that other texts are just as important um, as the Shakespeare plays themselves. So tracks and histories and uh, poems by other authors. And so that all of these different kinds of artifacts should be thought of um, on some sort of equal basis. Uh, and that really kind of opened things up for me. Uh, we started to talk about how Shakespeare, uh, Shakespeare's plays were popular culture at the time, how there wasn't one agreed upon version of Shakespeare's plays, how Shakespeare didn't actually write down his plays. These were reconstructed by the actors who had, had performed in his plays. And so all of this, of course, for a, a young graduate student was just, you know, blew my mind, right? Um, and what I had always known is that I had always been interested in film. And so I was trying to figure out how to take this 
high canonical author and uh, do something that, uh, in terms of film, what I was interested in, even though Ohio State was relatively traditional at that point. Um, so the first conference paper I wrote as a graduate student was about um, Hamlet uh, and the uh, ways in which Gertrude was represented when she drinks the poisoned wine. And I chose three different film versions that looked at different interpretations of whether or not Gertrude knows that the wine is poisoned or not. Um, and so I already knew that I was going to go into film and popular culture as a way of making uh, what I studied more accessible, uh, easier to teach, uh, and, of, and of more interest to me, basically. Right. Um, so. what I figured out relatively early, and there is an embarrassing photo of me in the middle uh, as a graduate student. And yes, those are blue jean shorts, everybody. Um, it's again, embarrassing. But this was um, when I sort of made my turn to Faulkner is uh, a bunch of graduate students, we all got together and we drove the many miles down to Oxford, Mississippi. Um, one summer, and I had already read some Faulkner. I fell in love with the with the place, and not I didn't fall in love with Mississippi. Let's be let's be honest. I, I fell in love with sort of this moment of history. This is the farmhouse slash plantation that Faulkner uh, bought and basically had to restore. Uh, kept a lot of his immediate family in it. There I am, uh, disrespectfully sitting on his grave. Um, and then on the on the left there is me in 2017, uh, the third time I had presented at the Faulkner conference. So my pilgrimages to this place continue to happen. The Faulkner conference takes place in Oxford, Mississippi every summer in July, in fact, which of course is a, a horrible thing to be in Mississippi in July. Um, but that's when they have it. It's the longest running um, conference uh, for one author. It's the, this was the 44th year um, of the conference. Uh, and so I've spent a lot of time um, amongst Faulkner scholars uh, doing conferences, doing conference papers. And what ended up happening is that I started to get a reputation as someone who was really interested in popular culture and when I started off, this was not reg uh, considered legitimate by a lot of people, by a lot of scholars. Um, there were the Faulkner novels that you paid attention to, the high art, um, and then a lot of this other stuff like his magazine stories and his screenplays and the, the movies that were based on his works um, were considered you know, lower forms, hack forms um, of culture. So, this is the Faulkner most of you are probably aware of. Right? The dapper man in his white muslin suit. Um, the, this is the Nobel Prize winner, the person who won two Pulitzers, um, the, the grand old man of letters, basically. Okay. Um, Faulkner wrote uh, 19 novels. Um, he's written some of what are considered the most important modernist American novels, Sound and the Fury, As I Lay Dying, Light in August, Absalom, Absalom. Um, and so he's become the most written about American author. Right? So this for a scholar is of course a problem. <laughs> if you've got somebody who everybody writes about. There's more articles and books published on Faulkner than any other American author right now. And so what I figured out is that a way to find a way into all that is to focus on um, this less respected work, this, um, these lower sort of forms, and to argue that in fact they aren't, that they're just as valuable as the high art uh, works. The, at this point, so I had decided I'm going to do Faulkner instead of Shakespeare. There was somebody who was working at Ohio State I really wanted to work with. Um, and I didn't know anything about the films that were, were based on Faulkner's works. The only one I was aware of was Intruder in the Dust. And Intruder in the Dust, which is a 1949 film, is the only one that Faulkner scholars will, or at least at the time, grudgingly accept it as being legitimate. And I'm going to show you a trailer for it, and you can kind of get an idea of why that is. Um, 
I should give you a warning. This trailer um, feels no compunction at using the N word. So that's also part of why uh, it's sort of considered more standard Faulkner. So let me show you this. It's about two minutes. fury that grips a town and whips it to the brink of violence, a mystery drama that quivers with suspense, the burning fever that spawns reckless, ruthless action, that's intruder in the dust. The strong force of pride and decency, which thrives even in the midst of terror. The faith of this boy, the courage of this man, the heart of this lady, that too is intruder in the dust a faithful dramatization of the superb novel by William Faulkner, one of the world's greatest living authors. You, young man, tell your uncle I wants to see him. Want to see who? Wants to see a lawyer. Lawyer? He ain't even gonna need an undertaker. Lucas, has it ever occurred to you that if you just said Mr. to white people and said it like you meant it, you might not be sitting here now? So I'm to commence now. I can start off by saying, Mr. Folks, that drags me out of here and builds a fire under me. Why didn't I believe Lucas? Why didn't he trust me as lawyer with the truth? You're a white man. Worse than that, you're a grown white man. So you're taking the case and are going to defend him, talk for him, hope to get him out? Yes. And you call yourself white folks? Mr. Gowry. My brother was killed by that nigger. Lucas Beecham is innocent. Not in this court. <laughs> Okay. Oops. So one of the reasons why Faulkner scholars love that movie is because a it's filmed in Oxford, Mississippi. So it was actually filmed on location where most of these sorts of events were supposed to happen. It feeds right into the reputation Faulkner had in the 1940s, late 1940s, as being America's writer about race relations, uh, about the injustices of the lynch mob. Um, and at this point, by 1949, Faulkner has been resurrected, basically. His reputation has been restored, primarily by Malcolm Cowley, who released the portable Faulkner three years before, that kind of brought him back into public recognition. Because for most of his career, Faulkner was not really uh, very revered and was not very well known. Uh, in fact, by 1946, every one of his novels was out of print. So Faulknerians really like this particular moment. They like Intruder in the Dust because it's a relatively uh, faithful adaptation of the novel. I actually think the movie is better than the novel. That's not a popular opinion, but I think the novel is a little bit wordy. <laughs> um, so that is the Faulkner that most people, if they know anything about his films, know. And I'm more interested in this Faulkner. So this is a, a photo of Faulkner in 1932, and then you've got two photos of him working in Hollywood. Um, and the Faulkner of the early 1930s and the Faulkner working in Hollywood is where I have ultimately spent most of my scholarly um, career looking at. Um, so surprising number of adaptations of Faulkner's work most of people don't know. Many, as you can see, with different titles than the original works. Um, 
when I first started working on this in the 1990s, almost none of these were available anywhere. You, like you could not find these online. You could not find VHS copies of these things. I had to go to museums to, to watch some of these. I had to buy some of these in, in reel to reel form, right, 16 millimeter form. Um, all of these are now available on DVD. Um, but it used to be really hard. And again, this sort of spoke to just how kind of forgotten this entire part um, of Faulkner's uh, life and career had been. Story of Temple Drake was just um, just been restored and released on Criterion, right? So the Criterion version of the Story of Temple Drake now. It's based on Sanctuary, and we're gonna talk about Sanctuary in a minute. Today We Live is a 1933 Howard Hawks movie with Joan Crawford. We'll talk about that in a little bit. It's based on a short story. Then you skip 16 years before we get another adaptation because again, no one's paying any attention to Faulkner. Um, then you get a spate of melodramas because the, the, the steamy melodrama is big in Hollywood. So you get the Tarnished Angels, which is a Douglas Sirk melodrama. You get the Long Hot Summer uh, which is a Martin Ritt melodrama, CinemaScope color. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Then you get the most hated adaptation, which is The Sound of the Fury of 1959, starring Yul Brenner as a Cajun with hair. So it's not a it's not a huge favorite, and it doesn't really follow the novel at all, right? This is part of what really uh, irks a lot of Faulkner scholars. Then you have a Lee Remick movie, Sanctuary from 1961. So there within those four or five years, you've got four movies uh, that came out um, and sort of sealed Faulkner's popularity and his reputation because by this point he had won the Nobel Prize, right? And then his last novel was The Reavers and a 1969 Steve McQueen movie comes out based on The Reavers, it's kind of a comedy. Uh, and then Tomorrow is a uh, Robert Duvall sort of indie film that came out in 1972. And then James, I don't do enough stuff, Franco has come up with two film adaptations of Faulkner's works, As It Lay Dying and Sam La Fury. Um, I think they're kind of interesting. They have not gotten a lot of good reviews. People do not like these movies. I think they don't like James Franco. Um, and what another recent development is that uh, it, in 2011, David Milch apparently bought the rights to all of the Faulkner works and was going to start producing Faulkner adaptations for HBO. But then David Milch uh, got Alzheimer's and that project has kind of just sort of disappeared. I don't know where it is now. I don't know if any of that stuff is going to come out or not. Um, so there are a lot of films uh, made based on those works. The only one of these films that Faulkner himself worked on was Today We Live. So Faulkner has nothing to do with the, any of these adaptations. He did not really like to think about um, working on them. He didn't mind people adapting his works. In fact, he was like, that's great, but it's not my work. So you know, have at it, do whatever you want to do with it. I don't really care, right? unlike a Stephen King, for example. But Faulkner did work on over 50 screenplays at one point or another over a course of several years. And there are some relatively well-known films that he, in fact, did, did part of the screenplay on. Uh, the Road to Glory is a World War I film that Howard Hawks directed. Gunga Din is an adventure film. Uh, so is Drums Along the Mohawk by John Ford. Air Force is a Howard Hawks war movie. To Have and Have Not is a Hemingway adaptation with uh, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall. It's the first movie they made together. Um, Mildred Pierce is a Joan Crawford uh, crime uh, film. And then The Big Sleep, of course, is film noir. It's Howard Hawks' sort of most famous film noir. Faulkner spent a fair amount of time working for Warner Brothers in the 1940s, and this is um, just going to show you a quick little piece. The, the Coen Brothers film Barton Fink is in, in part based on Faulkner's experiences um, in Hollywood uh, in the 1940s. He worked on a film called Slave Ship, and that's mentioned. Um, this character is also primarily uh, built up on Clifford Odets as well, but there is a character in the film who is supposed to be Faulkner and is uh, 
relying on Faulkner's reputation of being drunk all the time. And let's not say he was drunk all the time, but he was drunk a lot of the time. So let me show you a quick clip here. This is Barton Fink, who is new. He comes from the New York theater. This is played by John Turturro, has just gotten to Hollywood. He doesn't know what the hell is going on. And he's looking for um, someone to help um, advise him on how to write for Hollywood films. And he runs into this Faulkner character. Bill Mayhew. Sorry about the odor. Barton Fink. Jesus, W.P.? I beg your pardon? W.P. Mayhew, the writer? Yes, Bill, please. Bill? You're the finest novelist of our time. Why, thank you, son. How kind. Very kind. I had no idea you were... In Hollywood. All of us undomesticated riders eventually make our way out here to the Great Salt Lake. That's probably why I always have such a powerful thirst. A little social lubricant, Mr. Fink? No, it's a little early for me. Billy? If I'm imposing, you should say so. I, I know I'm really very busy. I, I just wanted to ask you a favor. Have you ever written a wrestling picture? You are dripping, sir. Mr. Fink, they have not invented a genre of picture that Bill Mayhew has not at one time or other been invited to a say. Well, what yes, is I have taken my stab at the wrestling form as I have stabbed at so many others, and with as little success. Well, how do you... I gather that you are freshmen here, eager for an upperclassman's council. However, just at the moment, I have drinking to do. Why don't you stop by my bungalow, which is number 15, later on this afternoon, and we will discuss wrestling scenarios and other things literary. So what that clip kind of points out is A, the sort of the stereotype of Faulkner as eternally unhappy, um, not able to write the screenplays, not able to do any work, um, and doing it primarily for money. And th that last part is true. Um, Faulkner was writing in Hollywood and writing for the for mainstream magazines um, because he was never making any money with his, with his more notable high modernist fiction. Uh, the Sound and the Fury, As I Lay Dying, none of these books are making any money. Um, so one of the things that I focus on in most of my work is this question of what is canonical, right? And so in literary studies, when we talk about the canon, we basically talk about the accepted works that we think are worthy of being taught. Right. Um, who are the authors that you tend to see in, in, in a list of uh, on a syllabus? Right. Who are, who are the authors that people think about as being um, the, the most complex, worthy authors? Right. So you've, you know, your Jane Austens and your Brontes and your Faulkners and your Hemingways and Toni Morrison. And the canon, of course, changes, it shifts. Um, it goes through different stages. And part of what I do is what, what is called cultural studies, what, which is sort of an interdisciplinary approach, thinking about not just sort of the standard definitions of what good literature is, but also thinking about um, consumers, how people read texts, how it's uh, given to them, how texts are marketed, um, what kind of historical events are happening at the time that sort of inform that reception and that production of those texts. 
So all of my scholarship basically does what some of these things that cultural studies likes to sort of approach, demystification, uh, making uh, writers more accessible for students, right? And you really need that when you're doing Faulkner because of course Faulkner has a reputation for being very difficult. Uh, and that is a deserved reputation, but there are also things that are much more accessible uh, in Faulkner's canon. Um, and I'm really interested in the idea of popular culture as being an indicator of what is on our minds, what are our anxieties, what is it that um, we are concerned about, how does popular culture, arguably more than high culture, sort of shape us, right? Shape us as a culture, as society. Um, so those are the things that I've really sort of worked on. Barton Fink does a nice job of making a joke out of Faulkner's time in Hollywood. It turns out that he did not write any of the books uh, while he was in Hollywood. His secretary did. He wrote all of the books, right? So the Coens having a little joke there about um, the failure of the grand artist, right? So these are the things that I'm focused on. All these are, I've got uh, chapters and articles in, in here. Um, I really thought I was going to run out of things to say about Faulkner and popular culture, and that has not <laughs> been the case. Um, there is, and there's so many more things that I still want to do, right? So I'm going to primarily talk uh, mostly about the 1930s, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the latest thing that, that came out uh, about the, uh, the long, hot summer. So I want to start with sanctuary because Sanctuary is now kind of considered sort of canonical Faulkner. It's considered a, a very good novel. It's considered a very challenging novel. Um, but at the time, in 1931, when it was published, it was considered trash. It was called a pot boiler. It was called hack work. It is lurid. It has rape in it. It has... Um, scenes of molestation, it has violence and murder, and it is a crime story basically about a, about a young uh, co-ed who gets kidnapped and learns to love it. You can see right there where the, where the problem is. This is not a work that Faulkner was particularly proud of, but he didn't, wasn't ashamed of it either. And it was actually his best-selling novel up to the 1940s. So Sound of the Fury, As It Lay Dying, Light in August, Absalom, none of those made any money, but Sanctuary, his hack work, um, makes money. Or it would have if his publisher had not gone out of business right after it had gotten published. So even with his best-selling novel, Faulkner gets no, <laughs> he gets no money from it. Um, these are paperbacks, these, these two here on the left are paperbacks um, from the 1940s and 1950s uh, when mass market paperbacks came into being. And Faulkner's really interesting because he's got all of these totally inappropriate covers for his works, right? All these very lurid covers that make it look like it's very exciting and things that are going on in there when it usually isn't. The one on the right here is, of course, is the much more staid and courtly uh, a vintage version from last year, right, which is taking Faulkner seriously as Faulkner, right, with the capital F. And Faulkner is competing at this time, so one of the reasons why he's not making any money is because nobody wants to buy The Sound of the Fury, because it's hard, it's difficult. Um, and why buy The Sound of the Fury when you can buy something from Erskine Caldwell? the pornographer of the South, as he has been called. So Erskine Caldwell, writing in the, around the same time, 1930s, 1940s, is the best-selling uh, writer in America. He is selling millions and millions of copies of these sort of sex in the South kinds of stories, right? Tobacco Road, God's Little Acre, hugely popular. Um, everyone is buying these novels. And in fact, Faulkner's brother, John, starts to write some of the same things and also outsells his brother, William. <laughs> so in the 30s and 40s, poor William Faulkner, who's writing these great, uh, some of the greatest American novels ever written, can't make a dime, right? can't get any money. Nobody wants to buy these things. He's got no other source of income. Um, so he starts to, um, 
cash in, right? So Sanctuaries published in 1931. In 1933, a film version comes out. Now, I see some of my students are in the room and they know what pre-code cinema is. And this is basically an era in Hollywood when the production code hadn't quite kicked in yet. So there is a code of conduct you're supposed to follow, but the producers of these films were breaking the rules all the time. The story of Temple Drake breaks lots of rules, right? It shows lots of things that it's not supposed to show. Drug use, alcohol abuse, murder, uh, suggestions of rape. The one um, sort of bargaining that they did, the producers did was to change the title. Right, because everyone knew that Sanctuary was this really notorious novel. So they changed it to the story of Temple Drake, um, trying to, to distance it away from Faulkner. But of course it doesn't work. Everybody knew who Temple Drake was, right, because of the name. I wanna show you a quick couple of just quick clips, just to give you an idea of what the story of Temple Drake is doing. And you might also notice that Faulkner's name is, is nowhere to be seen, right? You're not using Faulkner's name here because of its battles uh, with the production code. Uh, so let me show you a quick little clip. Face little fool. Now you're satisfied. You got them all fighting over you. You nice women. Now then, Doctor. Is so part of the argument I make um, about the story of Tim Oops, hold on. Part of the argument I make about the story of Temple Drake is that the the advertising is cashing in on some kind of illicit relationship between Temple and that character who was in the cabin with her. And that what, what that led me to was finding a lot about uh, Miriam Hopkins, the actress Miriam Hopkins, in the uh, trades and in the uh, Hollywood gossip magazines. And there was a lot of gossip about Miriam Hopkins in the early 1930s about her being bisexual. Uh, and it was all down to, there's no evidence that she was, but the, the gossip rags were really honing in on the fact that Miriam Hopkins was unmarried and had adopted a child. And so the emphasis in all of their works was uh, all of these um, magazine stories is about the maid who hangs out with Miriam Hopkins all the time, right? So the, these magazines don't come out explicitly and make some sort of claim but are clearly flirting with the idea of lesbianism or bisexuality as part of the appeal of Miriam Hopkins. And that translates into the way in which the film is advertised. There's not very much in the film itself that's lending itself to that, unless you count a half naked temple in the room with her, but the advertising, the, the uh, newspaper ads, the uh, press, all of that, um, is feeding into a different kind of understanding of reception. Right? And that was one of the things that uh, from a cultural studies approach, you look at advertising, you look at how a film is marketed, you look at what the reputation of the actors are, and those in inform your sort of understanding of the text. On the left here is the Saturday Evening Post um, uh, edition that came out with 
Faulkner's short story, Turnabout. Turnabout is a all male story set during World War I. And it's primarily about a, an American captain who sort of takes under his wing um, a young British sailor, um, finds him in the street drunk, tries to protect him, tries to take care of him. On the surface, that story, A, has not really, never really got a whole lot of attention, and B, the, the part of it that is sort of, sort of suggesting some kind of attraction on the part of those characters sort of got written out of Faulkner criticism, right? Faulkner's engagement with gay and queer sort of themes and ideas and characters was not something that a lot of people really wanted to address uh, in the early 1990s. Um, so part of what this particular uh, story kind of suggests is that there are multiple audiences available for a lot of these works that Faulkner is working on. So the Saturday Evening Post, which is a very conservative, family-friendly publication, you can read this story as an adventure story. You know, it's it's got action in it, it's got death, it's got sacrifice. Um, but at the same time that he was writing this, Faulkner was living in Greenwich Village. His pri his two best friends were gay. He went to uh, gay nightclubs in New York. Um, he was very aware of the um, queer culture that surrounds sailors and that that, that reputation uh, in the 1930s. Um, so my argument in this particular article is that it, it is clearly reads one way for the Saturday Evening Post audience, but it's also the kind of story that people who knew Faulkner would know there's probably this other kind of subtext. There's this other sort of queer reading available um, if we just you know, give it room to breathe, if we actually allow for Faulkner's reputation that we know now to be put away for a while and to understand him as someone who is writing, trying to make some money, trying to write for mainstream magazines, but also wanting to do something more artistic. He was never ashamed of his, of his magazine writing. Um, it just, it, it, it paid better than anything else. Uh, so he does a lot of really interesting, uh, particularly in the 30s, does a lot of very interesting um, magazine writing for Collier's, for uh, Red Book, Saturday Evening Post. He's got lots of these stories. Um, and this kept bringing me back to a lot of what was getting in the way of trying to understand these texts was Faulkner's reputation itself as the great writer, as the writer about race, as just writing about Mississippi. Um, and so part of what I like to do um, in my scholarship and also my teaching is to try to undermine that in some ways, to try to allow for multiple interpretations um, that don't get caught up in this idea of you know, what is a valid, um, legitimate reading. Uh, and then just quickly, if you haven't ever encountered anybody talking about doing a queer reading, it's primarily, it's not suggesting necessarily that the characters in, this, in, the, in the story are gay in any kind of you know, physical way. Um, it's suggesting something that there is um, a gender dynamic that is being explored that in some ways interrogates or challenges the traditional stereotyped codings that we might have. Um, so one of the things that Turnabout does is suggests this passive British sailor um, is somehow defined as being feminine. He's talked about as having a girlish face, et cetera. And the strong American captain is masculine and butch and, you know, and, um, but everybody's very concerned about their clothes and the fashion. And so it's really kind of a, a, a listicle of all of these kinds of stereotypes that we have about soldiers, about men in action, of a world without women, right? The kind of homosocial relationships that are established in war. Um, so there's no women whatsoever in the story, not one, not even a mention, right? Faulkner manages to sell this story um, to Hollywood. Hollywood says, this is great. This is fantastic. Howard Hawks is going to direct. This is, we love this. We want you to add Joan Crawford, though. So we would like you to find a place 
to put Joan Crawford, our biggest star, we would like you to find a place to put Joan Crawford into your all male war story. Okay. Um, so today we live, this is the one uh, adaptation that Faulkner himself worked on the screenplay. Faulkner has to figure out a way to bring Joan Crawford into the film. So what they've done is here is Gary Cooper plays the strong American, of course. Okay. Um, but he's not really interested in Ronnie, the British sailor. He's interested in Ronnie's sister, who is Joan Crawford, right? who is a very glamorous nurse. Right? So what I was expecting to find was that, you know, it was sort of going to do some weird, complicated love triangle or rectangle, because there's also a friend of Ronnie's. Um, but what I ended up arguing in this particular piece was that none of that stuff mattered. In the 1930s, what people wanted to see of Joan Crawford were her dresses. They wanted to see what she was wearing. They wanted her to change her outfit several times during the course of the film. They wanted to see what the latest designs were and very often would buy the latest designs. So a lot of stores would carry like the Joan Crawford dress from Letty Linton and the Joan Crawford dress from Today We Live. So the plot, what Faulkner and Hawks both did not understand is that Joan Crawford it didn't matter what you did with Joan Crawford, as long as you put her in a lot of outfits. So there are, I think she has nine costume changes in this film. I think she changes her clothes nine times. One of them is a nurse's outfit, a very smart nurse's outfit. Uh, but primarily at this time, you've got female audiences and female audiences are still gonna go to a war movie with Joan Crawford in it, but they don't care about the war stuff. They want to see romance and melodrama and outfits. And that was um, fascinating to figure out um, that the plot and the script and the, the action and the special effects, none of that was the primary reason why people would go to see this movie. By the way, it's not a very good movie. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make any sort of claims. It's not, it's not very interesting. Um, her dresses, on the other hand, are ridiculous. And uh, that's part of the fun. So there, it's a very campy kind of film uh, for this reason. And Adrian was one of the biggest designers at the time, uh, one of the, the, the best known uh, fashion designers. So let me really quickly get through to, I'm, not, I'm gonna skip the Tarnished Angels, just a, a quick note. So this was the first of the 50s films um, that uh, get made. We start to, in the 1950s, have a lot of interest in uh, melodramas, Peyton Plays, for example, right? A lot of Tennessee Williams adaptations are coming out, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, etc. Tarnished Angels is based on Pylon, which is about a love triangle, um, uh, and it gets turned into a Douglas Sirk, uh, Rock Hudson kind of film. And of course, Rock Hudson now with his reputation, of course, takes us back um, to thinking about his place within that uh, particular love triangle. What I want to get to just in the few minutes that I've got left here. So the last thing that I published uh, this last year was um, this article about, uh, primarily about the long hot summer and really about Paul Newman um, as, as object of desire um, on many levels in the film, right? So it's another one of the melodramas. Uh, it is, uh, Paul Newman is coming off of his role as Brick in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, right? So he played a repressed homosexual who can't deal with it and has to, to face up with this and he can't, uh, he's unhappy and he's a drunk. And then we get one year later, The Long Hot Summer, and my argument is that this, in fact, is a much more interesting take on uh, masculinity in the South. Um, that there is a, a way in which multiple, several different male figures in the film create, in a, in a sense, female empowerment, right? That it's not about um, condemning or categorizing um, sexuality. It's about finding a way for our main female character, Clara, to define her own sexuality. And that happens because of all these different kinds of fraught masculinity that are in play. So just real quickly, Here's Paul Newman, uh, object of multi-desire, multi of course. Um, up at the top there is Jody, who is 
you know, the troubled young man who the man who uh, is supposed to take over the, the plantation, but he's not man enough. He sweats a lot. The man up here on the right is decayed gentry. He is the old money person. He is the person who has been courting Clara for over a decade and won't make a move, right? He is clearly sort of coded as being gay uh, in a very sort of Southern sort of way. Um, so one of the ways that I sort of make sense of this is that the film gives you multiple kinds of masculinity, multiple uh, forms of femininity, and some of those, uh, some of those uh, desires, some of those passions would be considered gay or queer, um, but ultimately working towards Clara, the main female character, getting what she most desires. And the, what's so interesting about this particular film is that there aren't any villains. There are no bad guys. You don't make fun of the clearly mama's boy uh, stereotype. Uh, you don't end up making fun of Jody. You don't make fun of any of these women, including a spinster. The, the movie is sort of in, in some ways unique in how sort of gracious it is with exploring sexuality but then everybody in some ways being reconciled to it, right? Nobody gets punished. Nobody has to be punished, which is so often the case of Tennessee Williams plays, for example. Um, so I wanted to do, get done by 4.45, it was close. That's about all I've got uh, uh, for my presentation. So if anybody has questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you, and um, please feel free to unmute or place your questions in the chat. And um, I will read them out if you put them in the chat. Matt, while we're waiting, as you were talking, I was wondering if you had some ideas about among today's authors, if you see that Faulkner has like an air, somebody who explores the themes that you've described and has kind of a similar spirit. That's tough because the, I, I keep going, and this isn't just because I taught this class last summer, I keep going back to sort of Toni Morrison as being the, the necessary heir to Faulkner in some ways, right? That she is dealing with race relations, but from a black perspective and a female perspective um, and is influenced by Faulkner, right? She, she wrote her master's thesis on Faulkner. So she's huh. very aware of what he's doing. She admires it, but she also hones in on the gaps, the places that Faulkner doesn't go or can't go. Um, now, of course, Toni Morrison is also dead. So I'm trying to think if there's any living authors who are kind of taken on the mantle. Um, and I can't, I can't think of any off the top of my head. It's weird. The Southern literature, um, as that quote from Flannery O'Connor sort of suggested, really kind of, it had a peak in the 30s and 40s and, and, and then with Tennessee Williams. And then it's kind of it's kind of moved out of the canon in some ways. There's not a lot of canonical authors writing from the South right now. It's very weird. Huh. Yeah. That's really interesting. I didn't know Toni Morrison wrote her, her master's thesis on Faulkner. That's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, doc, um, Dr. Harrington Luker asks, oh. is Colson Whitehead? That is a very good suggestion, right? Uh, Colson Whitehead not necessarily Southern, but certainly I think an inheritor of, of, of some of that. Um, I wish I could think of somebody else. Um, it's, it's kind of embarrassing, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> and, and granted, contemporary fiction is not my, is not my area, but um, it, it, it does speak to that we've spent, a, there's a lot of energy exerted um, in something like Faulkner studies and having, you know, 45 straight conferences. And a lot, that means a lot of other authors are not being paid much attention to. And I think that is a problem, right? That we get so embedded and, and Faulkner 
didn't get sort of canceled by you know the uh, white male uh, thing, right? He didn't unlike Hemingway, who sort of kind of dropped out of the canon, right? The dead white male thing. Faulkner somehow survived the dead white male thing, but maybe to a detriment in some ways too. Interesting. Uh, Dr. Condella asks, um, he says, I'm not up on my Faulkner at all, but are there different camps of purists versus those who are okay with the hack or popularists, if that's a word? Oh yes, uh, absolutely. And I encountered many purists when I first presented on um, Today We Live. In fact, they were like, "Why are you, you know, why are you writing about this cr crappy movie?" I tried to watch it, and it was crappy. So you do have the sort of the old old guard who just want to talk mostly about the big four, right? The the modernists, the the the, the really important stuff, or they want to talk about the regional stuff. Um, but there is a camp of, you know, it's maybe 10 of us who do a lot of stuff with popular culture, right? So we're our own little tiny subgroup. Um, but it's also uh, an area where there's a lot of, um, a lot of work to still be done, right? There's, because people weren't paying a lot of attention to it. It's hard to say something new about Absalom Absalom, uh, but it's easy to say something new about, you know, James Franco's As I Lay Dying. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, but yes, there is definitely there, and there used to be more tension there, particularly when people started to bring in uh, queer readings. That caused a lot of problems with with some of the old guard. They did not want that to, to be brought up. So interesting. Um, Dr. Goma wants to know what were the grounds for Faulkner's reception of the Nobel Prize in 1950. What were the grounds of it? Like, why did he get it? <laughs> uh, Dr. Goma, feel free to unmute if you want to clarify. Sure, sure. Yes, that's what I mean. Like what, like usually the Nobel Award gives a, a press release and they sort of have um, some historicization, some, some explanation of why this author is so important. Right. Um, so the... The, the sort of official line was because Faulkner had this long career of telling eternal truths was sort of sort of the idea. Uh, he had, this was not long after Intruder in the Dust, which again is sort of a socially conscious kind of, of novel that, that people took seriously. But here's the reality of it is that in the late 40s, Faulkner was also doing a lot of State Department work. So he was flying all over the world, kind of imparting inspiring and pro-American messages of some sort. And I think that actually had a lot to do with it. Um, he is, because he hasn't really published, none of his, all of his best works are behind him. He has not really published anything that's considered a classic for over 20 years by this point. Um, so it's, it's weird timing. And he wins his two Pulitzers for two of his weakest books, right? So he wins the Pulitzer for A Fable, which is a World War I allegory about Jesus Christ returning to, to the war. It's not good. Uh, and then he also wins one for The Reavers, which is this kind of silly. So it's really kind of the, you win the Oscar for body of work as opposed to the film that you actually won it for, right? Paul Newman, Color of Money, right? He didn't win that for Color of Money. He won it because of all these previous uh, sort of accomplishments. And he's finally recognized it by 1950 as an important writer. He gets resurrected. And I think that's, I think that's why. Um, I have one here from Robert Welcome, who asks, when discussing queer theory, would you say you could queer any text, or are there texts with unique qualities that call for queering? Alexander Doty would say every text is open to some kind of um, queering, and what that basically means is, again, not some sort of fully formed um, gay identification or identity, but the idea that any kind of categories that have to do with masculine and feminine, male and female, um, are, are already in some ways unstable, all right? And our understanding of desire is uh, somehow escapes language 
in many ways, right? So that you can be thinking about how even characters who are um, part of a traditional heterosexual family, um, that's not, that doesn't mean that they aren't having any kinds of desires or experiences that somehow transcend that. And that could even be something as simple as that their closest, most uh, meaningful relationship is with somebody of the same sex, right? Like their best friend is in some ways more meaningful to them than their spouse, for example, right? So um, it's, a, it's obviously a question for debate. Um, most queer theorists would say any even heterosexual text um, is open to those kinds of questions and those kinds of uh, discussions about coding um, and allows us to think about also how is heterosexuality coded, right? Um, how has that changed over, over time? Um, so Robbie, I would say, yes, any text can be queered. That's my answer. Uh, Dr. Pilkowski has a question. Why, who helped, why, who helped producers? <laughs> Sorry, do you want to ask this? Yeah. Okay, you do it. Sorry, I'm, whatever. Um, <laughs> I mean, so the last film that you're talking about um, with, as James pointed out, Angela Lansbury and the women whose, um, whose characters were more nuanced, I think you said, in terms of representing um, their sexuality. Mm -hmm. um, the last film that you were talking about, and you said it was, it was different than the ones prior. So I'm wondering who had to take that risk or was it like, why was that able to happen at that period of time? Um, and then I had an unrelated question about that we can talk about another time alone, Matt, or whatever, um, about the gentleman who played the African-American defendant in the first clip that you mentioned. I'm, I'd like to know more about him. Uh, we can talk about him. He's Juano Hernandez. Um, okay. And yes, uh, very interesting actor from the uh, and again, that film was made in Oxford and um, he was not allowed to attend the uh, premiere. Of course. Yeah, of course. <laughs> oh, there, there goes your contradictions right there. The answer to the first question is weird. Oh, so, so interestingly enough, so the, the, you've got a husband and wife screenwriting team um, who have written a lot of these um, melodramas before. So I think they're part of the mix Martin Ritt, um, a good old fashioned social liberal um, who isn't a Southerner um, is part of it. But the real reason I think, and I can't prove this, but I think is because this is the film where Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward fell in love. And so the chemistry between those two characters and how open they are to that kind of chemistry. Um, the way in which people talk about the, the making of the film is that they were like, you really they felt something on the set and it really spoke to Clara, Woodward plays Clara, um, was going to be a less compelling, a less interesting, more of a prudish character as they had originally intended it. And then Joanne Woodward and, and Paul Newman, we get in a room together and they're like, that doesn't work. We can't have her be a prude. We, you can tell that she's dying for, for Paul Newman. And so I think that is one of those instances where the, the sort of the relationship on the set actually works to its benefit. It actually sort of changed their understanding of the character. Um, and Paul Newman at this time has a reputation of being uh, very open to... Um, to, to, to uh, very open to uh, uh, queer readings. Uh, he's kind of at this point is getting kind of compared to James Dean and Marlon Brando, who are both have that idea of fluid sexuality, and Newman is embracing that at this point. So this is like his second or third film. So the fact that you've got a young Paul Newman, he falls in love with Joanne Woodward, they sort of kind of reimagine her character. I think that's what happens, and it's it's lightning in a bottle because the, almost the exact same team make Sound and the Fury the following year and it is terrible. It is a disaster. Joanne Woodward's in it again and it's awful. Um, so I do think it's one of those just many different factors coming together. I have a question from Dr. Mitchell and if you'd like to unmute and ask it, feel free um, or I can read it, whatever you prefer. I can, I can read it. 
So basically, uh, really interesting, Matt, as someone else who, who really enjoys working in popular culture, I, I salute your, your efforts. Um, so the South to me is always like this infamous place in the gay community, right? Because it's permissive and repressive at the same time, right? There's always these stories of my roommate, right? Like in, in, a, in a way that is very, under, it's, it's very understood what it is. And yet at the same time, no one talks about it. And so I'm just curious why Faulkner scholars reject queer readings or did initially, was it more connected to what was going on in the eighties and nineties in the U S with the rise of, you know, um, the, the AIDS crisis and, you know, uh, gay activism. It's really interesting because it's again, Faulkner's mentor, Phil Stone was openly gay in, in Oxford you know, in the 1920s and 1930s. His best friend, Ben Wasson, was openly gay. So like, you know, as you're saying, like everybody knows that these are his best friends. And these are the people he hangs out with the most. What happened, I think, at least initially with Faulkner and why this became, so, there was such resistance to the idea is because of his biographers. So his biographer, particularly Joseph Blotner, was another one of his friends, but he did not like Ben Wasson. He did not like Phil Stone. He did not like the association of Faulkner with homosexuality in any way. So he kind of wrote this two volume, massive, very influential biography that kind of wrote out the queer parts, like kind of took them out in some ways. Um, and you go back and you look at his notes and there's a scene, for example, where Faulkner, um, is room, he's, he's rooming with a bunch of guys in, in Greenwich Village. And one of them, Ben Wasson comes in and Faulkner gives him a dozen roses, right? And Ben Wasson's like, what the hell? Why are you, why are you giving me a dozen roses? And, and Faulkner basically just says, because I love you, right? Joseph Blotner, and again, I don't think Faulkner really had any kind of sustained you know, relationships or anything like that, but he was very open to, uh, particularly in the 1930s. And I think that 1970s biography essentially kind of set a precedent, wrote it out, and then everybody else was kind of like, oh, well, all of that must have just been natural and you know, normal, so we don't really have to think about it, even though, and, and most of the stories that explicitly address queer ideas, it just never really made it into the, 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 the Faulkner canon. People didn't discuss them. Um, there's a story called Divorce in Naples, which is basically about uh, two men who are in love, who are in prison talking about breaking up. You're like, okay, well now, you know, how, <laughs> how are we gonna completely divorce Faulkner from this if we have that? And if you read The Sound and the Fury, uh, there's clearly, it's there, right? Um, and I also think just, uh, I think Faulkner criticism, at least initially in the, in the 80s primarily, um, uh, was relatively conservative. Uh, it didn't really feel like that was where we go with Faulkner. We go to talk about race with Faulkner and class issues. We don't, we're not interested in gender issues. Uh, and that really only kind of it was really the 90s when that becomes more and more. And you, and you actually get more women coming to the Faulkner Conference and becoming Faulkner scholars because it was a very male, really male gang for a very long time there. Thanks. Sure. That, was that Angela Lansbury in the movie? It was Angela Lansbury. She is playing Orson Welles' mistress in that particular <laughs> film. She's pretty hot in there. Very hot. <laughs> Angela Lansbury is like fantastic because again she is just basically like hey i'm really cool with being your mistress absolutely she's great <laughs> um we have uh one more question um from miranda Hotch hockbird um even though hollywood movies are typically considered to be low culture do you feel as though at least some of the uh, his film adaptations would be considered high culture because of how Faulkner is regarded now, especially considering that one is part of the Criterion collection? I think, yeah, I wouldn't want to call them necessarily high culture, but certainly uh, valuable films that are worthy of study. Like, so the story of Temple Drake, the one that got um, you know, uh, restored and is in the Criterion collection now, um, 
It's fascinating. And it has one of the best known 1930s cinematographers. It visually, it's, it's stunning. The acting is really good. Um, even the use of music is interesting. And it is um, a really good example of where pre-code Hollywood is trying to negotiate with the production code. And it's also, as you could tell from the clip, it's tying right into the popularity of the gangster film at that time, right? Trigger, right? That character's name is not Trigger in, in, the, in the novel Sanctuary. That character's name is Popeye. Um, and so, of course, Paramount also owns the rights to Popeye. So they <laughs> changed the name to Trigger and to emphasize more of this gangster element. So Jack LaRue is this, you know, plays this gangster. So I think that movie in particular is really interesting. I think the Tarnished Angels is a very artistic film. Douglas Sirk movies are considered, um, you know, really important films from the 1950s. Uh, you know, he did Magnificent Obsession and movies like that. Um, so yes, I think some of them are, I think Intruder in the Dust is a very good film. Um, that some of them are not very good. Again, Today We Live, I cannot make a case for Today We Live. This is not a good movie. It's just not. Um, uh, but I think that Faulkner's reputation um, ultimately doesn't end up determining a whole lot about the ways in which these movies make their way into the film canon. That usually has more to do with things like a Howard Hawks film, right? Or is this part of Miriam Hopkins's canon, that sort of thing. Most people in, within the film community don't know anything about Faulkner, don't care about Faulkner really. Thank you. Good we to hear you, well, Miranda. <laughs> and we have another one from uh, Jen McClanahan. Dr. McClanahan, if you want to unmute, you can feel free to, or I can read it. Uh, yeah, no, I can. There's stuff happening behind me, but I think I can get through without too much. <laughs> um, OK, so love the jean shorts. That's where I wanted to start. Thank you find my camera so I'm not just talking okay um and I thought 2021 might be the year to bring him back which led me to ask what and then a comment I wonder if Jasmine Ward I don't know if you've read her she might be in that lineage at least as someone to think about yeah that's good in that line um and just wondering what your next project is what you're working on if the if you're going to present at the conference virtually this year or, what's next what they're doing with the conference this year um so I'm finished up an article on um, The Road to Glory, which is a Howard Hawks, I briefly mentioned it, 1936 World War I movie. And what's really interesting about that movie is that it is not just based on a, a previous French film, French World War I movie, but in fact uses almost all of the combat footage from the French film was made into the Hollywood film. So. They basically sat Faulkner and the other screenwriter down and said, here's this French movie, make it into a Hollywood movie. <laughs> Take out all of these French characters and put in these characters. Um, so uh, it, again, it's got a female interest, June Lang. It has uh, Frederick March and Lionel Barrymore in it. Uh, so it uses all of this really raw footage from this virulently anti-war French film and then turns it into this kind of Hollywood melodrama in some ways. And I think it's a really interesting film, but it's not, there's, there, there's no really good version of it. It hasn't been restored or anything. It's been a completely sort of forgotten uh, movie. So that is one. And then the other thing that I've really wanted to work on um, with Faulkner, that I've got other projects, but the one I wanted to work with Faulkner is Land of the Pharaohs, which is a 1955 Howard Hawks movie that's one of these you know, big widescreen epics and it is about the building of the pyramids that Faulkner co-wrote. And it is a train wreck. It is really, really bad. Joan Collins is the femme fatale in it. Um, it, it's, uh, it was filmed on location in Egypt uh, so it's a lot of really interesting sort of filming history to it. So that is something I would like to do more with 
um, but I need to get to the Margaret Herrick Museum in LA to do any more with that. So um, that's going to be if I ever get a sabbatical <laughs> project. And and stop making fun of my jean shorts. It was totally in at the time. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, I I would love if you'd cut a pair of jeans for me because that was that was really good. <laughs> And I had a ponytail too. So uh, let's just forget all of these things. <laughs> well, uh, seeing no more questions, unless we get a, a latecomer, um, keep an eye over there. I want to thank you, Dr. Ramsey, for a terrific presentation. I learned a lot today. And thank you to everyone here. It's great seeing all of your faces and names all together, even though we can't be together in the library. Um, yes, everybody. <laughs> Virtual applause for you. Um, uh, Dr. Goma says, Egypt and film panel. She'll do Charlie Chan in Egypt. Oh, that's from Chad, actually. Uh, Dr. Raymond. Um, so thank you all. Uh, and um, I uh, urge you to, um, to uh, we can't do our after cookie conversation, but if you have follow up questions for Dr. Ramsey, I'm sure he'd love to hear from you. And um, please join us for our next lecture with Dr. Uh, Mangieri, which is in a few weeks. Um, so thank you all for coming, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. And thank you, students, for coming. Thanks, Dr. Ramsey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Ramsey. Thanks, Dr. Ramsey. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Dr. Ramsey. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Ramsey. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was great, Matt. Thank you so much. <laughs>